Good morning, everyone. Just giving um, uh, folks a few minutes to uh, to get on, and we'll get started uh, right at noon. So you can uh, just look at me doing uh, random stuff for the next couple of minutes. So enjoy that. And in a few minutes, I'll also go over um, the ways that you can participate by asking questions or um, uh, just, um, providing comments to the cast uh, and creative team for the show. We are also live streaming this on YouTube and um, Facebook. So you can, uh, those, these will also be recorded there. So you can watch them again later or share them with friends if you're so interested. I have young children in the background. So if you see them or hear them, just pretend like they are not there, please. All right. Well, uh, we're right at noon. So good uh, noon, everybody. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, with our lunchtime lecture for WIT today by talking about the ways that you can participate in this uh, lecture. So we have uh, a couple of different options. Um, for those of you uh, actually on the Zoom webinar with us, you can use the chat function um, at the uh, bottom of your screen. You can use the chat function to submit questions, or there's also a Q&A box um, where you can also submit questions anonymously there if you uh, like or publicly, it doesn't have to be anonymous. Um, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, simply comment on those platforms and I will um, relay the information to our panelists um, when, uh, when it's time. So uh, hello everyone, my name is Dwayne Harris. I'm the executive director of the Little Theater of Manchester and it's, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here uh, today, virtually welcome you. Um, this is uh, now our second uh, lunchtime lecture in this format, uh, given uh, the state of the world. Um, and, you know, it presents this whole uh, trying to do things virtually has presented a number of challenges for us, but I think um, that we are handling them uh, pretty well and are able to, we are very, very grateful that we're able to still connect with you um, in the same way. Well, we all wish it could be in person. Um, but here we are. Um, so uh, before we get into the, um, the actual meat of to the conversation and, uh, and bring on David Garns, um, who is our dramaturg and our, our, um, our uh, theater historian, um, as well as our host of the Lunchtime Lecture Series, um, I just wanted to briefly, uh, since I had your attention, uh, touch on um, our planning that's going on um, for uh, the rest of 2020 and as well as 2021. So we are, um, uh, you know, we, there are two things that are sort of driving all of our decisions at this point. One is what we're allowed to do um, given uh, state mandates. And um, as you uh, may or may not know right now, um, indoor events can only have a maximum of 25 people, including the people on the stage and in, in the front of house. So really that, that, that pretty much counts us out of being able to do anything, um, uh, at least in the way that would be meaningful in Cheney Hall. Um, but that restriction may or may not ease up in the next phase of, of reopenings. Um, 
Uh, we may be limited to 50 people. We may be limited to 25% capacity. So we're, we're eagerly watching all of that um, and are trying to make decisions based on the information, you know, the best information that we have. Um, so all that is to say for at least for the rest of 2020, um, we, we'd love to be able to do some sort of off, you know, sort of off brand programming, whether it is doing uh, some sort of uh, evenings at seven uh, upstairs in the main hall where we can all be socially distanced. Um, that may or may not be a possibility, whether it's bringing back some of our um, postponed uh, concerts and doing a limited um, engagement um, of those. Um, all that remains to be seen. Um, but if you have any thoughts or, or opinions or want to let us um, know anything about potentially doing something in 2020, please reach out and let us know. Um, you can always email me at dharris at cheneyhall.org or through Facebook or our website or whatever uh, means um, works best for you. Um, as far as planning for 2021, you know, we'd be launching or getting uh, ready to ramp up our, our announcement for uh, the next season at this point in the normal course of things. But since it's not the normal course of things, um, we are still uh, in deep, meaningful, uh, and thoroughly uh, engaged conversations about what to do for 2021. Uh, we want to be able to provide you all with um, uh, the theater that you've come to expect from us, but also keep everyone, including um, our patrons, our staff, our volunteers, um, all as safe as possible. So we're trying to figure out what that looks like um, for the next season and uh, hope to be able to put together some plan, um, again, based on the best information that we have and and provide that information to you sooner rather than later so that you can make decisions about how you want to um, engage with us in the first half of 2021. So um, uh, be on the lookout for that information and uh, we'll definitely be reaching out um, at some point, uh, hopefully in the next couple of months to be able to provide you an update um, on what 2021 looks like for the Little Theater of Manchester. So thanks for your patience for the last five minutes as I've sort of babbled on, but let's get to the main point of today um, to talk about uh, WIT. Um, we, uh, uh, this is a, a uh, sort of Evenings at Seven production um, that we uh, did. Um, and I have to be careful about what I say because I don't in any way want to make it seem like I am advertising um, anything. But if you signed up for this lunchtime lecture via our website, then you know um, that you have the opportunity to sign up for uh, a, a streamed version of the show. So um, if you have not done that yet, I recommend that you uh, check out our website um, and check out the lunchtime lecture information for this so that you might see that opportunity there. So with that, I will be quiet and I will introduce uh, Mr. David Garns, who is going to uh, do the more important talking than I am. And I will, let's see, try to do this as smoothly as possible. All right, David, you should have received a notification to start your camera. Maybe. There you are. There All right, and I will go away. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Dwayne. And uh, welcome everyone, uh, wherever you are, and thanks for joining us. I'd like to uh, echo what Dwayne said about our being able to provide you with some aspects of what our normal year would be like. Hopefully more will be coming. Um, I, for one, personally just feel very grateful that there are people at, at LTM, and actually that would be most of the people at LPM, LTM who have a much better understanding and knowledge of all this technical business. I'm just glad to be able to continue to uh, proceed in, you know, in my role as dramaturg and commentator. So I'm very happy that we have the opportunity to continue to do this. So some of you like me are still thinking if you attended last night's uh, Little Theater of Manchester presentation of WIT, I think I'm still experiencing some sort of emotional hangover or an emotional high. I can't quite decide, but if you saw it too, then you'll know what I mean. Maybe it's a bit of, or a lot of both. 
And if you're intending to watch the repeat showing tomorrow afternoon, I, I do want to say I think you're in for a rare theatrical experience. So I'm going to say a few words about WIT, some backstory material and so forth, and then our guests will join us. In 1935, way back then, comedian Jimmy Durante appeared on Broadway in the Billy Rose Broadway musical, Jumbo. In one scene, a police officer stops him as he, Jimmy, leads a live elephant on stage. The officer asks, what are you doing with that elephant? Durante's reply, as only Jimmy Durante could carry it off, is, what elephant? And it always stopped the show. So this is an example of how the phrase, the elephant in the room, has become a catchword, a metaphor, if you will, for an important or enormous topic, question, or controversial issue that is obvious or that everyone knows about, but no one mentions or wants to discuss. Why? Because it makes at least some of us uncomfortable or is personally, socially, or politically embarrassing, controversial, inflammatory, or dangerous, or simply it's something we don't want to face, much less talk about. So in life, it's always a challenge to confront the elephant. We all have our elephants in the room that appear at different parts, times in our life. To actually have it front and center in a theatrical situation is even more of a challenge. And when you have a play whose protagonist is actually the elephant in the room, talking frankly and uh, eloquently, actually, our protagonist is a very eloquent woman, well-spoken. And sometimes she's talking directly to you, the viewer, you have a play because of this, I think, that has the potential to be life-changing for all involved. So in Margaret Edson's play, Wit, we have this topic, cancer, and we have a character, Vivian Baring, who is experiencing its final stages. We know from the get-go what's going on. The beauty and the truth of this play is how Vivian's approach to life and death are resolved. It's rare in my theater going experience to have a play say so much in its brief 90 minute length. Yes, it's about death, but it's very much about life as well and how we choose to live it and what we might discover as life evolves slowly, suddenly, inexorably into death. So let me say a little bit about the playwright. Margaret Edson has an interesting background. Her undergraduate degree from Smith was in Renaissance history. Her graduate work at Georgetown was in literature. But upon finishing uh, her graduate degree, she worked for some time in the uh, AIDS, HIV, and cancer wing of a research hospital. She later taught elementary school children in the Washington DC area and has continued as a teacher. She lives in the Atlanta area with her wife and two children. Wit, amazingly, is her only play thus far. But what a play it is. She shopped the play, the, her, her written manuscript at many venues before it was done at a repertory theater in California, and then at Long Wharf here in Connecticut, in New Haven. Kathleen Chalfin then reprised her role at Long Wharf off-Broadway, where it ran for over 100 performances and received many awards, including the New York Drama Critics Circle Award, the Drama Desk Award, and the Pulitzer Prize. It wasn't eligible in that run for uh, a Tony Award because of it was not on Broadway. Chalfin later toured with the play, as did Judith Light, and a later Broadway revival with Cynthia Nixon received several Tony nominations. It was also adapted as a film with Emma Thompson as Dr. Vivian Baring. Let me just note one more thing. 
The words of English poet John Donne figure significantly in this play, as you will learn when you see it, or you may have already seen it last night, but if you see it tomorrow, particularly his sonnets. In some editions of the play, you'll see the title written both as wit, W-I-T, and wit, semicolon, T. This is in a way an homage to Dunn as to his use of both semicolons and commas in his sonnets. But pay attention to its use in the play. It becomes in its variations, which punctuation is it going to be? Another strong metaphor for the pause between life and death and the separation or not of the two. So that's, I, going to stop talking now and without further ado, let's have discussion. So I believe our panelists are going to pop up on the screen at any moment. And I'll I'll wait till that happens and then I'll I'll uh, have them begin to talk. Uh, hi, David. It's Dwayne. Just um, so you know, as they're uh, all unmuting and turning their videos on, um, the uh, I'm sorry, Jane Sarosky is going to join us as well. So she's oh, calling good, in now, and uh, as soon as she gets on, I'll make her a panelist. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's great. I'm glad Jane's here. She she is in the play. She acts in the play. So. I see people gradually appearing. So, um, Dwayne, would you tell me when everyone is here? Because I, I can't, I don't see everyone. At the sure, moment. everyone is here now. Okay, perfect. Um, so what I'd like to do is, uh, I'd like to have each of you say a few words. We're gonna have some discussion later on as well. But for now, say a few words about your particular function, your role in this production, uh, and anything else, really, anything that you would like to say about how this play has impacted you? Were you or were you not familiar with it before this, this, we, we have done this production? Uh, anything that you'd, that you'd like to say that you think would uh, be of interest and enlighten the audience or that is particularly important to you? I think I'm going to ask Todd, who is our director, to begin. So, Todd, would you just tell us a little bit of set set the setting for the for what um, what's going on in this play, and and also please tell us why you really wanted to do it, which I understand is is the case. I think that's how this possibly came about. Yes, absolutely. First of all, hi everybody. Um, thank you, David, for for having this. Um, for it. this oh, you're welcome. Um, love hearing you speak about theater history. Um, the um, so yeah, so um, I'm directing this production and um, uh, production of this um, virtual production, and um, yeah, I, I first became aware of this play at least 20 years ago, I think it was, and um, so um, I, I just I loved how. Um, profound it was. I love how succinct it was. Um, and also, um, when you look at the themes, when, when you look at like what, what's being said during the play, when it, when it really, really boils, down, boils down to it, the messaging of the play is very, very simple uh, and very simplistic. Um, and um, what's really cool is you, when you watch the, uh, and Debbie could probably speak more to this because this is her character. Um, when you look at this woman's journey throughout the course of these, of this 90 minutes and it, and, you, and, she, and the realizations that she makes, um, it's pretty profound to set because you know I you know as someone who loves to be around you know you know academics and high ways of thinking and doing things ultimately at the end of the day it comes down to the most simplistic of things that brings you comfort joy happiness um, and so that really is something that really resonated with me with this um, we originally uh, when we were all doing physical live theater together hi Jane how are you just saw you come on um, the um, 
we were supposed to do another play for evenings at seven. We were supposed to do um, a play called the Waverly gallery. And um, Debbie and Colin were signed on to do that. And um, obviously COVID-19 happened. So that didn't happen um, uh, for a number of different reasons. So we had to find another play um, to take its place. So, uh, and wit was always something that's been in the back of my mind. I, did, I directed a production of it with students about 15 years ago. And um, I always wanted to do it with adults. So um, the opportunity presented itself. And so we submitted it and, and we're doing it now. Um, I think it's, um, it's, 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 it's 90 minutes. So it's a pretty easy sit, uh, easy sitting to watch this thing. Um, it's perfect for, you know, July, um, something nice and short. And um, there's some, you know, despite the dense um, sensibilities of John Dunn and the, and the incredibly wordy stuff that Vivian Baring says, the main character, there's actually, the play is actually infused with lots of humanity, lots of, lots of humor, a lot of humor actually. Um, and just, um, just, I think the messaging overall, I don't want to give too much away. The, the, the messages that come out of the play are things that we, I think we as a society need to hear right now. Um, so I think the, in that way, I think it, this, is, this will resonate with people very, very deeply. So that's what yeah. thank, thank you, Todd. And, and we'll, you know, we'll be coming back to you and as we, as we go along and as subjects come up. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, uh, if any one of the four of you may jump in. Debbie, will you want to, do you want to go? Uh, sure. sure. Um, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'm Debbie Freund and I play Vivian Baring. Um, she's the protagonist of the show um, who discloses right in the first five sentences that she has um, metastatic ovarian cancer. Um, and as uh, both David and, and Todd and Dwayne um, talked about, it's about her journey. And um, as she says at one point in the show, she says, um, I always thought that being smart would take care of, of me. And, um, and she is, she's brilliant. She's a, a brilliant John Dunn scholar. And uh, for those of you who don't know, you certainly know his work. Uh, you know, um, Death Be Not Proud you know the whole for whom the bell tolls, you know no man is an island. Um, so we all certainly grew up and we've, we've come across um, uh, parts of his poetry and, and um, throughout our lifetimes. And so it was really wonderful to actually start looking at, at, um, at John Donne and what made him flip in his life from a very um, uh, kind of, um, Mm, well, he, he ultimately became a very devout man. He became an Anglican uh, minister and started and wrote the Holy Sonnets, most of which were published after his death. And um, the show is just, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, I, I can't describe it enough. Um, uh, it's, um, it's very unique in the fact that she has probably about a dozen um, monologues that she has directly to the audience where she breaks right through the fourth wall and she speaks directly to the audience, which is kind of difficult to do when we're all in these little boxes, all still looking at the same little green dot that's in front of us and says that we're on. Um, uh, so, um, and that was a lot of, of Todd working with us to make those transitions when we can't get up and, and move around and walk and walk around. Um, it's just, uh, uh, it's that comma. It's that moment between, um, between life and death. It's, uh, it's transcending um, uh, the miracle, the cycle that is our lives. It is a beautiful piece. And, and I think for me, the, you wanna find Margaret Etson and say, how could this have been the only thing you wrote? Um, because it's just, it really says so much. And all of the characters are, are beautiful and unique and very fleshed out and, um, and I'll stop talking. Yeah. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> you know, I, when I was watching it last night, I, I was struck by how well constructed it is. And one of the things I noticed, and, and I'm gonna ask Jane to speak next because Jane plays a character who is significant in this woman's life, in Vivian Baring's life. And she appears in the play significantly and 
purposely at the beginning and at the very end. And uh, you might want to say a little bit about that, but a uh, very interesting character who is influential in both aspects of our protagonist's life when she's being very scholarly, but when she needs something else as well. So you, Jane, would you say a few words? Sure, David. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Nice to be here. I'm Jane Sarosky and I play Professor Ashford, who, as David mentioned, was a very important part of um, Vivian's life, uh, both as how she formed her career and her uh, avocation really and what she dedicated her life to and how she plays a, a very significant significant portion in Vivian's life towards the end of the play and it's a, it's a very it is a well very well written show and what was my observation as an actress being used to being on stage and not having that capability to be able to um, physically express and, and find ways. And Todd did a great job in helping me and the rest of the cast on how you can portray those emotions in a two-dimensional format instead of a you know three-dimensional, four-dimensional format that we have on live theater. Um, but it, it was a real, pleasure to play kind of a dichotomy of what this person represented. I'm trying not to give too much away, which is why I sound so hesitant. Um, in the beginning of the beginning of the show and how she relates to Vivian and then how she relates to her at the end of the at the end of the play is really just poignant and a great challenge for an actress. And what was great about this, because we were doing it in a live stream format, people that hadn't seen me perform in years, like my sister who happens to live in South Carolina and coworkers who live all over the country um, have logged in to watch the show and you know, have said how intense it was, what a great performance. And you realize how these words of the playwright affect people even in, in this format, instead of you know experiencing it live, so it, it was a great honor. I was very happy that Todd asked me to be part of the cast. Thanks for doing it. <laughs> yeah, th thank you, thank you, Jane. Uh, and now our our two other characters, who are the actors that are with us today, are both involved at the hospital. They these are hospital people. And so I think I'd like to ask uh, Colin, would you, would you say a few words next about your character? Very important character in the play. You have a big part. Uh, tell us your thoughts. Uh, yes. Um, well, hi, uh, I'm Colin Kinnick. Uh, I play Jason Posner in the show. Uh, Jason Posner is a very young um, doctor doctor oncologist uh, for Vivian. And uh, he's very married to his work. Um, nothing really takes him away from the hospital and especially from Vivian who has become more of a research um, assignment rather than a human being. And I think being in a college setting, I'm going to be a junior at UConn, knowing how people kind of react to college and kind of become in their own and find what they want to do with their lives. I can almost see that transformation in people from being in a, a primary school and at first just going into an occupation and really going into it because they love it and want to do it and then fully immersing themselves and becoming one with the occupation and almost losing emotion with the occupation and just trying to get the work done because it almost feels better to them to accomplish the work than it is doing the work. 
and going, uh, having to battle those emotions as Jason uh, was a very tough thing to do. I, uh, I personally have uh, experience with uh, cancer with someone close to me. Uh, so having, seeing that and being that close to it and being a person who is almost on the side of the illness is something that I've never had to experience before. And it was almost cathartic in a way that I could enter that part of myself and kind of explore that. Because as an actor, that's one of the biggest things that we try to do is explore every possible part of our minds and our bodies. And so it was just a pleasure to be able to do that. So thank you, Todd, for Thank you. How do you. Create, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Colin. I, I I think that's very interesting. And it it to speak again to the construction of the play. There is another person who works at the hospital, who has exactly the opposite relationship to her patients, and that's a, there's a nurse who plays a significant role, and her approach is, in other words, she is first and foremost, a caring, a caregiver. And she doesn't really know or care to know or even understand a lot of the technology of what's going on, but she's as important as the people who are, who have been treating uh, our, our protagonist from the beginning in terms of just her disease. Um, so I think it's interesting to hear that. And I also liked what you said about relating personally to this. You know, just one, when I was a kid, cancer was something that you didn't really talk about. It was, it was something that if you knew someone in, certainly in your family, but in the neighborhood, let's say who had cancer, it was, it was a very, very scary, not talked about thing. And I think that wit has helped to bring the discussion to the fore. And uh, I just want to mention that. I think it's a great service that, that Margaret Edson has done in that regard, in addition to the literary merits of the play. Um, so, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, Billy, you, you have two roles in this production. You also play one of the doctors, uh, but you're also the stage manager. So say a few words about your character, but I'd love to hear some of your thoughts, you know, as part of the production. Yeah. Um, so hi, I'm Billy Winter. Um, I am acting as the stage manager for this production, um, which is a challenge to say the least. Um, <laughs> so for these virtual productions, um, what I'm responsible for is making sure everyone's audio and video are working. Um, I'm literally turning on and off everyone's videos to uh, handle the entrances and exits. Um, there's a lot going on behind the scenes uh, for these shows. Um, and it's a challenge to be doing that and also be acting in it uh, at the same time. Uh, but I'm very happy to be able to do it. Um, so I'm, I'm playing a couple different, um, I guess you could say ensemble parts. Um, I am uh, one of the uh, residents at the hospital um, studying under Vivian's uh, doctor. Um, and I think there's a couple of us that are playing this, this role. And I think it's nice to see uh, sort of the perspective from other folks in the hospital on how uh, Jason handles dealing with not only the patients, but the the subject matter that he's working on and how uh, deep he dives into his work. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, you know, David, I, I agree. I think this is a really uh, interesting show in that we get to uh, get, you know, in the head of someone who's going through cancer and sort of see that incredibly difficult 
uh, journey that they go through from, you know, diagnosis to wherever they end up. Yeah, I I was struck by, there's there's an important scene in the play in terms of making it clear how how Vivian is seen, as it were, by the people in the hospital. And it's when you all are on the, your rounds or the doctor is on his rounds and you're following along, you and two other, uh, I, I don't know if they're residents or doctors or, uh, uh, and then also uh, the character that, that Colin plays to, who is a doctor, but are the others meant to be residents as well? Oh, uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Um, and how, how she really kind of distances herself from the, I mean, she talks about how ironic, you know, the grand rounds and so forth, but I've, I've seen, I've been in hospitals as a visitor many times when this team has come through as doing their grand rounds. And it's really quite an experience because you, you really do get to see how, how, how the different people who are entering the room react and behave vis-a-vis the patient. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're all trying to you know, be, maintain their professional, but, there, but there's a difference. You can tell there's a, there's a slight difference in the way that they're reacting. And I think that comes across very clearly. I noticed that you all have had different expressions on your faces during those scenes. And it, it worked very, very well because of course we could having, being able to see everyone on the screen at the same time is, is unusual. You don't really have to move your head around the, you know, the stage to take a look at each person. So it's in many ways, it's a very interesting experience to, as a viewer, to witness several people who are on stage, but instead of being on stage, they're on this fairly small screen and you're really looking with one glance at all of them. David, uh, if, if, yes. I, if I may interrupt. So for those of you who are in the audience right now watching, if you have uh, been around LTM for any length of time, you know basically all of us except for one. You've seen Billy on stage, Jane, Todd, uh, Todd directs, I direct, Jane directs. You've seen David on, in the lunchtime lectures. Well, what you may know, what you don't know is that Colin Kinnick is currently sitting in Missouri So he is a student at at UConn who uh, we saw last year, we're very impressed with. And um, before we could make anything happen, UConn closed and Colin is home. So so none of us, all of us that came together for this show, we've never been together. We've always been in our, you know, nine spaces. in, in all different locations. So that's been very, very different. And, yeah. and, and, and when Debbie says currently, she means right this minute as you're watching him. <laughs> so you can get a view of a, the interior of a Missouri house, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Everything we thought it would be. Um, no, and actually, and Debbie brings up a really good point. And I think it's, and this isn't unique to LTM, I think because there's other theaters that are doing these virtual readings as well. One of the benefits of doing this is being able to work with actors who you normally wouldn't be able to put together in one theater. So um, it's just really, really cool to, um, be able to collaborate with people from all different parts of, I mean, I know that I'm, I'm working on one, one right now where we have actors from like, who all come from their own respective theaters, but they never would ever go to this one theater. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, it's really, really cool. Um, something just about, just about the rehearsal process, just in general. Um, and I, I said this to the actors uh, when we started out, um, that was w- people, I purposely went out of my way to find actors who could work on instinct, sell a story, um, so that when we hit the gr- when we hit the ground running, we were we were we were we had the best of the best here. And I mean, and uh, Billy, I mentioned you know th- the ensemble track. It's the Billy's part along with our two other actors. Um, um, they they take on the role of like the Greek chorus, and all three of those actors are leading are leading actors in their own right. So there's really not a weak there's not a weak one in the bunch right now. We have we have people who really really know 
the craft of understand the craft of acting um, and understand how to connect with people, even if it is, you know, states away from people. So that was really nice to be able to have that. And also a, a conscious decision that we had made in the rehearsal process, because it is a reading. Um, the last thing we wanted to have was people, you know, with a printed script reading like this, so that all you saw was this for the whole time, because how do you connect like that? So um, we went to painstaking efforts to make sure that, you know, people were looking at the camera at that green light. Um, and um, and I, I don't want to speak for people, but I'm, I was watching some people and I think some stuff was actually memorized. Um, I can only speak for myself on this. It, it, it's so funny because, um, you know, as we love the main stage productions, we live for them, they're amazing. But I think sometimes, sometimes the stuff that comes out of the Evenings of Seven series, things that comes out that come out of staged readings in general are kind of the parts that we almost get more excited about because they're ones that you wouldn't necessarily do on a main stage, but for an actor, they're incredibly rewarding. Um, yeah. I know I've had a few of those at LTM and other, and other places. So if you're going to give me a great part, the last thing I want to do is read it. So um, I know a lot of people, you know, were memorizing certain parts of the show as well. So, um, you know, we, we, we did our best to get the information as much as we could. We did the best to get out of our heads as much as we could and just, you know, be truthful and, and tell the story. And I think also what's really, really cool is just being able to practice with the, just, just the acting style. You know, we're not playing to, you know, you know, the last row, you know, a hundred feet back or whatever, we're, it's, it's a very intimate performance and this is a very intimate show. So because we had those things going for us, we were able to do a, to do a productionist that we might not necessarily be able to do if this was on a stage. Yeah. Yeah, and, and no, go ahead, Deb. Yeah. No, I was just going to say there's another question there about rehearsals, Todd. If, mm -hmm. if you want to answer it. What was the question? Uh, it's what were the rehearsals like? Are they all on Zoom? Yeah, they're all on Zoom. Yeah, they're all on Zoom, and we would we work certain. We kind of handled it like we would in any other show. We we did a read through. We broke some scenes apart. We worked on some stuff. Um, worked on timing, worked on pacing. There were a couple moments in the show where we tried to be creative in some of the staging that we did. So that took some time. Um, yeah. uh, were you always all present at the rehearsals? Most of them, all? yeah. Yeah, most of them, most, most of them. Um, there, there were a few where we worked with a, certain, with, with a couple of actors just on their specific scenes. Um, Debbie was in all of them. I will say this, there is one scene in the show that Debbie that doesn't speak in at all. If this was if this was a real a real stage production, she would be on stage. The character never leaves the stage. Vivian never ever leaves the stage. And there's one scene that goes on where there's, there's dialogue where she doesn't have any dialogue in that one scene. But otherwise, she's on for the whole thing. Yeah. Let me ask a question uh, to all of you, actually, and a couple of you have alluded to this. But uh, is there anything about this production being done as a online distance? Uh, project that you think actually has has been more effective than it might have been as part of a stage production. I've already mentioned how, as a viewer, I I love the fact that I can watch your faces so clearly. You know, it's a it's a a real bonus, I think. And because think even if you're not in dialogue, I'm still you know we're still seeing you. And I, I noticed very, I, I absolutely noticed how your expressions, you, you stayed in character all the time, all of you. Um, but so is there any, yeah, Deb. The blocking was easier. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess. Uh, you want to explain what blocking is? <laughs> well, where you all had, well, some, you explain. I mean, it's where you all have to be standing and so forth, right? But, but actually in this case it would be you're all stationary sitting right <laughs> I mean, well you have to focus you focus on the text more and you yeah. focus on you know and <laughs> uh you know there was one point that i got kind of late in the game but you know in my character but i think it allows you to focus on the the meaning of the text more and how to use different acting muscles to get your point across that you might rely on physicality to be able to do that. And what you focus on is to your point, David, facial expressions 
tone of voice, timbre of voice, um, you know, you know, I was supposed to play an 80 year old woman at the end. And, you know, I'd be in my head, I know if we were doing it on stage, it'd be like, well, how am I walking? Am I walking too fast? Or, and so it's that I felt made me a better actress, you know, and learned more by doing something like this has been, was my experience. And it, my sister has been texting me too, ironically, as we mentioned, she's like, I bawled my eyes out at, at the end. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, yeah. it really, it, yeah, I, I'm just like, really? That's good. You know, as actors, we love to hear that. <laughs> no, no, no I can tell you the, the um, there are two really big things for me. So number one, um, I, I won't speak for all actors, but I, I, uh, I, I think I speak for some of them here. One of the most important things that we experience when we're on the stage is that um, synchronicity between us and the audience. I mean, you hear people breathe, they laugh, they sigh, they, oh, they, you know, they make sounds and you take that and that helps, um, you make decisions off of that as as you're really in the here and now. Okay, you're 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 processing all of that, and in something this intimate, I really missed that. I I missed that a lot, um, and uh, and it hurt me for her for Vivian, um, but. As Jane was just talking about in terms of, of your acting muscles, for me, the the what Todd worked so um, so comfortably with me was making those transitions because you don't have the ability to see it. You know, on stage you might walk then from here to here, or you cross over, or you do something, and and we don't have that availability. So it all has to be done with the interpretation of the next moment. And, and so Todd would work, you know, on where that transition was and, and what was going on in the next moment and what was happening in her head and what was happening around us. And, and so that was brand new in terms of learning um, things, you know, learning more acting skills or better acting skills. Yeah. Well, as, as yeah, I would the, say, yeah, it, it, Billy and, uh, and uh, Colin, Let's hear from you. Uh, as an acting student, uh, one of the biggest things that I try to hit on is how can I become more versatile as I uh, learn more and grow older. And being so far away and being in front of a camera instead of on a stage is um, a different experience, but it's an experience that I might have to be a part of. You know, I really don't want to say, oh, I am only a stage actor. I want to make sure that I am prepared for any sort of medium that comes my way, even if this might be a new normal. Um, so I want to be prepared for that. And one thing, uh, one of the ways I try to be prepared for that is learn different parts of me that can be more specific. Uh, like Jane was talking about uh, on stage, she would think about, oh, I'm an 80 year, 80 year old woman, so I have to walk this way. Well, now that 80 year old woman went from 5'5 five, five to about 8 by 10. So like <laughs> you, you need to kind of sell that character, but it's chest up now. And I mean, through a camera, through movies and television, that's really what those actors are doing is you're selling, you know, this um, 28 year old uh, genius who is so stressed about this woman because she's this little science project, but he's become to have uh, caregiving feelings to her that he's not even sure about. And I'm supposed to relay that through an eight by 10 image. And I think that's a huge challenge. And um, as actors, I think we're all kind of insane to go up to this challenge, but it's, it's one that we're all confident that this is what we want to do. And um, this is exactly what we signed up for. So I'm 
I'm overall happy for this opportunity to be able to work on that versatility. Yeah, Billy, do you want to add anything to that? Um, just that I agree with everything everyone said. It's it's a big shift uh, to go from worrying about you know things like physicality and movement uh, to just worrying about you know from from the chest up to having to. Uh, you don't get to rely on the audience to inform your performance. It's all through the text uh, and, and, you know, what we're hearing of the other actors, if we can't even see them because we've got our script up or, or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Do uh, you know, I have a couple of other questions, but if we have some, uh, are there any other questions, Dwayne, that you've noted on the chat? Uh, Sorry, I couldn't figure out how to unmute myself. Um, uh, no questions yet, but oh, wait, just something came through. Um, no, but um, if anyone does have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or the Q&A, or also um, there's a little symbol at the bottom where you can raise your hand. If you wanna raise your hand, I can actually um, allow you to talk and um, you can ask your question uh, directly to um, the panelist. I do. I have a question in the meantime, before, if anyone is in the middle of writing right now, let me get that one in. Uh, so how did you, how did you feel watching this last night? I'm assuming that maybe all of you did, or a couple of you may have seen it before, but uh, if you didn't, what, what was, what was your reaction to see yourself in a close up the entire time you were performing? That, which is really what it is. How did that feel? I was too chicken to watch last night. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, I didn't want to see myself. <laughs> yeah, it's it's quite a, it's a it's a real experience for the viewer. But I'm wondering how it is for the person who's watching himself or herself. You know. In. In, a, in an expanded view, you know, if you have a large monitor, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big picture. You know? Oh, David, forget it. I'm not going on now. Yeah, Jane, I don't <laughs> to hear from, uh, from watching tomorrow night, but, but that, I, I thought about that a lot while I was watching it because I felt so privileged to be able to see the nuances of your expressions, either when you were speaking or not. I was in a separate room so I could hear my family, you know, watching the show and, and most of all, hearing the show, it was a lot different than being in the moment with the show because for people that haven't acted before, you connect with the show, it becomes one with you. So when you hear certain lines and you hear certain sounds like uh, last night I, you know, heard, was hearing uh, Debbie throw up into the little <laughs> bucket and yeah. my heart just started racing because of just how in that moment, how it impacted me, not only as my character, but as a human being. And that, that was one of the moments that really, uh, I wasn't in the scene, but when I was off camera, it allowed me to really get pumped up for my own uh, my own um, character, my own scene, because it made me feel like as Jason that I have to fix this. This is the problem that is in front of me that I'm hearing, seeing that, I, that I'm the one that's supposed to be the hero here. So- yeah. It, it was a very visceral scene, I may add. I mean, it was extremely effective. It was, it was, shocking in a way that it was supposed to be mm -hmm. you know you were this was this is what her life was becoming well please don't let anybody think that you see anything all you hear is uh, somebody gagging but no there's no you know it's it, but you did it so well debbie you did it you went for pure naturalism with this show i know really <laughs> Now, she took out the cack before. If, if we do have a question from the audience, I, I, if, I, if not, I do have another question that I'm 
I'd be interested in hearing your opinions on. May I go ahead, Dwayne? Is there any? Uh, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I, what I'd like to have you talk about is, so what about Vivian? Did, did Vivian lead a well-led life? How do you feel about Vivian at the end? Without, we're not gonna, we don't wanna give things away, but uh, how strong are her regrets about certain things? Would she have lived her life the way she lived it if she could live it over? What, 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 how do you end up feeling about her? Is she a cautionary lesson to us or is she an admirable lesson? I think both. I don't think they're, they're not mutually exclusive. I think that, I think that um, she's an accomplished woman. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily go on to say she's a happy woman, but she's, she's an accomplished woman. I think that there's two different things right there. And um, I think that... Um, th and she I, was driven to be accomplished, yeah. to your point. That, yeah. that was her goal, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. But it also highlights what you give up when that's a singular focus in yeah. your life. I don't mean, that, I'm sorry, Todd, to take over. But. No, 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 and I think, I, I'm probably the wrong person to be, to be answering this right now, but I think that that no. also, th this gets into some gender roles too, because I think that um, it's different for women than it is for men, when it comes to having to be an accomplished person versus also what you're also expected to do to be considered having a fulfilled life, I think as well. Um, yeah. So, and I'm gonna just shut up on that because that's all I really got to offer for that, that that's just my personal, um, view from no but as director i that you certainly yeah. wanted to hear your opinion on that todd uh thanks what about the rest of what 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 do you think how do you feel debbie about well, i i don't do think i don't think it's the a question of of what's behind you i think it's a question of what's in front of you and and um and she finds that so there are no regrets um uh the the you know she she finds it she finds the fulfillment um the irony of the situation is the very um tough life that she led with her students and um the standard that she held them to and the kind of uh, coldness that she um, is the exact same thing that um, uh, Posner is doing. And he is a previous student. And he has now, he has, he's not looking at kindness and, and which is what she kind of reaches out to him for. And, and, and he is looking at research and knowledge and all the things. Data. Yes, exactly. And all the things that were so important to her. That's right. And that's right. And then at the very, very end, I'm not going to say what happens, but he has to acknowledge something. And it's hard for him to do that. And uh, I think it's amazing in 90 minutes how much we learn. Now, I also want to add that she does have no regrets, partially thanks to the people who are with her at the very end. They are there to provide her with something. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. And I, that makes all the difference. But yeah. for me, I have to say, the best monologue in the show, the part that pulls it all together is Jane's, is when Jane talks about death be not proud and the purpose of that punctuation and what that punctuation means. Yeah. And yeah. that is just, and it's early in the story and it takes it, it is just such a beautiful, piece of writing and and um you know where she talks about you know all the things that dunn dealt with i mean you know god the soul life death what else is in there are missing two i think jane i think there were six of them uh faith um it, it's it's and that, that there's a simplicity in all that there's a lot of kerfuffle around what people think but really it's just a comma right Going yeah. back to the original yeah. point, it's, it's, it's just and it's simplicity. It's simplicity. Yeah. And this yeah. play did a beautiful job of taking some very, very dense metaphysical stuff and making it um, uh, accessible 
and making yeah, she it did. And, and, and distilling yeah. it down to very simplistic terms. Yeah, it's not a it's not a semi. It's a comma. It's 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 what comes next. You know, it there's a connection and the breath. That, that monologue is set up early enough in the play that it stays with you because at first you think, you know, it's a significant monologue. You know that. And so in the back of my mind as a viewer, I was thinking, all right, this is, I want, I want to remember this and pay attention to it as this play progresses. And sure enough, it, it, it was very important. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're very near the end. Um, are, are there any other? I have to, David, I have to say something, okay? Yes, so, so there are, I believe nine of us up front in this show. I think there's Todd and eight actors something like mm -hmm. that. Is that, okay. So, but this, just like any show that you see on stage, it's the same thing here. There are a lot of other people who are working to make this happen. And so we really have to thank David, your lunchtime lectures, you as our host and our dramaturg, you just bring a beauty and a, um, uh, a wisdom and a heart to all of the shows that we do. And I really want to thank you so much for that. Well, um, thank I, I, I want to go ahead. That I get the enthusiasm from all of you. Oh, it's, no. it's catching. So we have to thank, you know, our executive director. I mean, uh, Dwayne Harris, you're always working in the background, making, you know, making everything look good. Debbie, uh, I know it's not Gustafson anymore, but Debbie Gus, who is so often interacting with all of you who are our patrons. We can't wait till we're all together again. But we also need to, to thank Sean Precunier. That's his logo you're looking at, LTM at home. He's doing that. He's doing all this editing and sitting right there with him, not in the same room, got to is is Billy Winter, who as here you've seen. And so Billy is, as the stage manager, he's responsible for marking all of the different scenes where people are entering, exiting, all of that. We've also got, and, and we couldn't do it without you two and the amount of work that you do in that week between the time we film and the time that everybody gets to see it. Um, Ron Shalek, for your your um, your sound effects that I know uh, were used the moment I heard the music and everything, I was like, "Oh, they, um, who else am I missing, Todd?" Um, that's that's everybody who worked on this production. Um, yeah. I want to just uh, thank, thank my friend Jim who got us the hospital robe in a very very short amount of time, um, and um, yeah, I think that's everybody. Uh, and when you see the play tomorrow night, if you haven't seen it yet. The tomorrow credit, afternoon. I mean, I'm sorry, tomorrow afternoon. Yes, two o'clock. Thank you. Uh, the, you'll see the credits at the end and, you know, pay attention. As Debbie said, there is a lot that goes on that you never really see. You see the effects of what has been done, but you don't realize that there are real people necessarily behind every one of those things that you've appreciated. So, yeah, so we're... Yeah, I'm sorry, David. I was just going to jump in. Um, we're right at one o'clock, so I just wanted to quickly say, um, you know, again, check out our website if uh, if you want to see what they're talking about for tomorrow at two p.m. Again, I'm not advertising uh, the show; just saying, check it out. Um, and then um, uh, also, just sign up for while you're on our website. Sign up for our email newsletter because that's that's the best way that we have to communicate about all these things. Um, there are plans uh, to do more of what had previously been our evenings at seven series um, in this format. And um, you know, again, we can't necessarily advertise that stuff. So uh, the best way is to sign up for our email newsletter, and uh, that way you get the information directly emailed to you. And um, I think with that, I just want to say thank you to everyone here. Um, WIT is a very special show for me personally. I have uh, very fond memories of working on it in college, and it was great to uh, see you all work on it again. So thank you all um, so much. And um, with that, um, if anybody has any further questions or wanted to follow up on anything, feel free to send us an email at info at Thank you all very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye, thank you. Bye, bye. Hi, guys. Bye, bye. Thank you out there. For, for tuning in. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Pleasure. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone.